When you see the black flags coming from the direction of Khorasan, and Afghanistan is a part of Khorasan, go and join our army, because no one will be able to stop that army until it reaches Jerusalem. And so the British tried to colonize Afghanistan, and the British failed. And then the Russians tried, and the Russians failed. And guess who is trying now? <laughs> we honor and we respect Mullah Omar. We honor him and we respect him. Because all those other excellencies, rulers in the Muslim world, if they had been ordered by Uncle Sam to hand over Osama bin Laden, they would have handed him faster than Federal Express. But Mullah Umar said no. And may Allah bless him. Mullah Umar said no. If he has committed this crime, give us the evidence. That was a very reasonable request. But Uncle Sam replied and said, no, we are not accustomed to this kind of response. We, Uncle Sam, when we say stand up, you stand up. When we say sit down, you sit down. So Mullah Omar replied and said, we are Muslims and we don't treat our guests like that. So we honor him and we respect him for the integrity of his heart and for his matchless courage. He knew what his people were going to face. He said, when the Soviet Union attacked us, they took our cities and they took our airports. But they couldn't take the countryside. And we fought them from the mountains. And we fought them from the countryside. And it took us 12 years to throw the Soviet Union out. And so, Uncle Sam, the battle has just started in Afghanistan. It has just started. The day will come when Islam will throw the, Soviet, throw the United States out of Afghanistan. Yes, which is why I have not returned to New York. No, I left the United States at the end of September last year. And since then, my address is a suitcase. I've constantly traveled. I have no home, none. If I go back to the United States and I speak the way I'm speaking now, they won't be able to stomach it, not the Jews. And so I'd be imprisoned to silence me, yes. So I am of more value to my people outside of the United States than in the United States. When that Muslim army defeats the United States in Afghanistan, even if it takes 25, 30, 40 years, it is that army which will be unstoppable. Unstoppable. When our army reaches the Holy Land, our brothers, the Taliban, we won't comment on them from a political point of view, because that's not the nature of our talk today. But let us comment on them for an accomplishment that they and only they were able to do in the modern world. In the modern world between America, Great Britain, China, Russia, Germany, France, Japan, Italy, between the major countries in the world, the drug trafficking is a business and an industry of over $78 billion a year. $78 billion a year. Can you imagine what kind of industry it is? And can you imagine the tragedy, the disparagement, the disease that drugs have brought in the modern world as a result of this industry? Yet, all of these sophisticated countries have found no solution for the drug problem. In fact, they have chosen 
to benefit, profit, and regulate the drug traffic because they are unable to stop it. Yet, consider this. The Taliban in Afghanistan became an official government after the defeat of the Russians. And at that time, Afghanistan was the major theater, corridor in the world for drugs. 61% of all of the heroin of the world was produced between Afghanistan and China. And the Russian gangsters, criminals, were the ones that controlled this industry. Part of the war of Afghanistan had to do with drugs. Not oil, not gas, but drugs. When the government of Russia was defeated and pushed out of Afghanistan, Afghanistan become immersed in civil war. We know that, isn't it? Civil war. That civil war had two sides. The atheists, the socialists, the communists among the Afghanis, and the Muslims who wanted to follow the Quran and the Sunnah. The North, the Northern Alliance, who themselves were related to the Russian gangsters, who were mostly Muslims who had adopted socialism, atheism, who themselves were criminals. They wanted to continue the enterprise of drugs after the Russians moved out. They wanted to continue the, the, the industry of prostitution, gambling, all of this here. And the Muslims said, no, we won't continue that. We want to establish Islam. And they began to have wars between them. One of the groups that were insisting upon the Quran and the Sunnah were called the students. In the Arabic language, the students is Talib or Taliban. And on one occasion, those atheists, socialists, communist Afghanis, those criminal Afghanis, they entered some villages and they raped the women. And some of those women escaped and they ran to seek protection with those students. And those students, they sought to get a fatwa from their shuyuk. What should we do about these Muslims who did this act? Those scholars said they should be punished. They are criminals and the hukum is to find them and kill them as criminals. Those students then took their weapons and gathered themselves together as a group and called themselves the Taliban. And they began to seek the honor of those women who were raped. And they went from village to village, town to town, until in a two-year period of time, they conquered all of Afghanistan. Two years. They conquered all of Afghanistan, except only 19%. 80% of Afghanistan they conquered in two years. Who were they? They did not have sophistication. They were walking, riding donkeys and horses, fighting on foot, fighting for the honor of their women, for the honor of their country, for the honor of Islam. And in two years' time, they subdued the entire country. Of course, they were not sophisticated in their knowledge. They did not have universities. They did not have institutions. Even in most of Afghanistan, there was not a standing hospital. But they established what they called the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. The only standing Islamic Emirate in the world at that time. Yes, they were ragtag. They were not sophisticated. But they had honor and love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inside their hearts. And we don't know 
as Muslims, we don't know any connection with the Taliban to September the 11th. So let's be clear about that. We don't know, we don't have any evidence or any proof that they had any connection to that, except that they would not give up their brother, Osama bin Laden. We don't make any comments about what happened because we don't know. But we don't indict people without evidence. And we certainly don't in indict a country because someone is living there whom someone else feels is indicted. But let me get back to the issue. Afghanistan came under the rule of the Taliban and they were faced with a, a challenge. How, what are they going to do with the drug industry which they found in Afghanistan? The Taliban made a decision. From a point of honor, from a point of morality, a point of dignity and decency, from a point of Sharia, they could not support and allow drug trafficking to exist in Afghanistan. So what did they do? They began to punish those who held drugs, those who sold drugs, and they began to imprison those that used drugs. Then they gave an option to the farmers who were the growers of poppies in Afghanistan, the major crops for drugs, isn't it? They told them, we will give you the land where you are growing the poppies. You, it's, you take the land, but you must grow another crop. You must grow a different crop. But if you don't grow another crop, then we will bury you on that land. That's the only option they gave them. In a year and a half after the fatwa came about this issue, a year and a half, the drug trafficking and the growing of drugs and the manufacture of drugs in Afghanistan was 3%. How? How did an unsophisticated group of students without government, without sophisticated institutions, how did they do this? How did they eliminate an industry which represented 61% of the, of the source of drugs in the entire world? How did they do that? They did it from their Iman. They did it because they were affected by the Quran. They did it because they were affected by the behavior of Muhammad wasallam. And this is why I say as an example, that Islam and only Islam has the properties by which to affect the human being's consciousness, to design and regulate his morals, and even to regulate governments so that even governments themselves are forced to adhere to rules of decency and dignity.